that you, everything goes according to the successes that you have already planned out for us. May the information be well received and may the contributions be well given. Amen. I now hand you over to the Honorable Faris Alwari. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. As I welcome an entire live audience joining us courtesy TTT. Um, so remember, you will be immortalized, some of you. So choose your words carefully when we get to question and answer. It's good to be at the University of the West Indies. And it's good to have an audience comprising minds and voices that certainly have a role to play in our society. It gives me great pleasure to carry on the discussions that we've been having at the governmental level concerning this issue of decriminalization. And I propose in today's format to introduce some of the information. A lot of it is going to be presented to the public by way of our web access. We have not quite put it up yet because coming out of our first series of discussions, we had the opportunity to fine tune some of the material that people asked us to have a look at. Today we're actually going to introduce slightly scrubbed statistics. We were asked to introduce some further reflections and we've had a chance to do that. I propose to be much shorter in contribution than I was on the last occasion. Obviously, uh, many of you were not there on the last occasion. So bear in mind that as you see slides coming forward, it's going to be available to the population. It's going to be live access obtained. And what we really want to do today is to have that question and answer, to have the interaction coming from the audience. Today, we've taken on board the recommendation to have a time moderator because um, we have a little tendency to want to have a re-education campaign on several uh, different input ends. Okay, So I'm being polite to say, watch your time, watch your content, get to the point. Please say who you are, where you come from, what your views are, because it's that that we want to catch in this exercise. This is a discussion, ladies and gentlemen. It's intended to facilitate a movement. It's intended to bring about a result. There's a lot going on in our country. There's a lot of worth that comes from the population. Laws are not made only in the parliament. Sometimes you end in the parliament, you arrive there, and you think, today is going to be an easy day, because what's on the table is so easily to be accepted. Last night in the Senate, we were discussing whether there should be a public and private sex offenders registry. We presented data which demonstrates that thousands of babies are being sexually abused and that their perpetrators are known and some of them have gone to jail. And when released and reintroduced into society, sexual predators are living next door to you and someone that you know. And whilst that seemed after nine months of government preparation to be an easy conversation to have, guess what? It wasn't as easy as we thought it was going to be. Because after 19 years of a sex offenders registry, which has nobody on it, the discussion that came back to us was, let's talk some more. So ladies and gentlemen, that's why we're here in this forum today talking some more about the issue of cannabis, its role and function. So let's get direct to it. And forgive me if I don't stand at the podium. I understand that I am mic'd. I'm not sure if the mic is working in the audience, so I'll, I'll try it. So forgive me. I'm not sure. Yes, here we go. So I was chaining myself on Julie. So we have Minister Hines who has joined us who is in the wrong seat of the audience. He's supposed to be on chair. So Minister Hines, can you please join us? I know you were juggling two other important matters that we had going on. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome my colleague, Mr. Fitzgerald Hines. I recognize in the audience the Minister of Agriculture. He's a huge player in this event. I recognize the Minister of Health. He's a bigger player in the event, and I'll explain that in a little while, as we also have with us 
um, two very distinguished gentlemen who are going to sit in the question and answer on these chairs in the persons of Marcus Ramkisun and Dr. Pottinger, who are going to field some of the questions from their perspectives. So, decriminalization of marijuana 2019, that's us, we're here to talk. The issue of marijuana is the debate. Decriminalization or legalization? What is it? You've heard the two concepts. Basically, put quite simply, legalization is there are no rules governing it. There is legalized growing of bhaji in Trinidad and Tobago or Callaloo bush. In other words, then, you can grow it, you can sell it. So if something is fully legalized, you can have it. There are versions of control on that which is legalized, like alcohol. It's legal to sell alcohol, it's legal to sell tobacco, but there are certain restrictions on it. Age, public interaction, location, whether you're on the job or not. That's the one end of the spectrum in legalization. Decriminalization is a different issue. Decriminalization centers around, forgive me, decriminalization centers around um, an issue, just we get the pointers right, Okay, so there's a little delay in the response. So decriminalization centers around an issue that is being discussed in the public. Should we treat with black market? Should we treat with accessibility? Should we manage product control? What quantities? As I recognize the Minister of Sport and Youth Affairs in all her resplendent glory here with us as well. What sort of management of information and interaction should we have? Of course, the definition of marijuana is multipurpose. Kush, sensi, weed, hashish, peng, spliff. Call it what you will, ganja, cannabis. Call it by its schedule one name, as in the United States of America, under its international categorization name, as you see in the conventions that apply, or under the first schedule of the Dangerous Drugs Act, which is our law, the point is that it is a substance which is known to the laws of Trinidad and Tobago, and it is chemically defined. That chemical definition really focuses on three types of product, marijuana, hashish, and hash oil, but really the schedule one description of the drug is where we get down to the basics of what it is called. So cannabis is defined in the Dangerous Drugs Act, chapter 1125, as, as you see on screen, cannabis, cannabis sativa, cannabis sativa L, their preparations, derivatives, I stress, similar synthetic preparations, for example, cannabis resin, cannabis marijuana, cannabis in its multiple forms, which I will not pronounce, lest I embarrass myself. So, that's the definition as it appears in the laws, it's in the full schedule. Bottom line, if you've got it in any form, it can be tested chemically, and you're put into court to, de to decide whether this plant-like or resin-like or oil-like substance is chemically that which is in the act. Of course, there are international trends. You see here on screen, 1961 Convention, the Psychotropic Substances Convention 1971, and the United Nations Convention Against Illicit Traffic in Narcotics and Psychotropic Substances 1988. What does that mean? The world has a perspective on cannabis. I understand and respect many of our contributors, particularly from the Rastafarian faith, that say the herb is the herb, and the herb comes from God, and natural law is different from man-made law, and therefore we ought not to call it dangerous. The fact is, we also have to accept that the rest of the world calls it dangerous because there are effects to it. So we're dealing with the reality of what it is and what it is defined in the contemporary world, and the international conventions are the ones that speak to that. Let's get to fines and penalties under the Dangerous Drugs Act, and what does that mean? We've taken a little tour here, because in discussing the issue of decriminalization, obviously you want to know what's the criminal side that applies to the de decriminalization. What am I going to be subjected to if I enter upon this? So, Sections 4, 5, 6A, 7. Section 4, minister may issue a license. Possession and trafficking in dangerous drugs. Indictment of offense. Licensed persons not to supply. And take a look at some of the fines. $25,000, five years. That's 
summary conviction. That is, you go to a magistrate's court and you're dealt with. Conviction on indictment, 50,000. Um, imprisonment not exceeding 10 years, but not less than five. And then you see indictment offenses, fines of $100,000. Then we start talking about the multiplication. If you've got a certain quantity, they can multiply the street value and take the fine to that value. So if you're in possession of $2 million worth of marijuana, then you're looking at three times two million in terms of a potential fine or penalty. The, I'm gonna to come to section four in a little while, and I'm also gonna to come to section eight. Pharmacists not to supply, delivery of dangerous drugs to minister, unlawful for physician to prescribe or give, sell drug except for medicinal purposes, underscore. These sections are beginning to point out the truth of what our Dangerous Drugs Act looks like, including 12, 13, 17. What does our Drugs Act look like? It looks like that we have broad law. And permit me to explain that. The Dangerous Drugs Act is an act of parliament. It is Dangerous Drugs Act chapter 1125. It is act number 38 of 1991. So since 1991, we've had a law on our books that is actually much more progressive than most people understand. In 1991, we inserted in the law two very important sections, section four and section five of that act. And I'm gonna read for this audience section four of the act. Section four of the act, is critical for us to understand before I come to the next aspects of children and proceeds of crime. Section four of the Dangerous Drugs Act, listen to this. The minister, minister of health, may subject to regulations made under 57, issue licenses for the import, export, diversion, sale, manufacture, production, or distribution at a stated place of any dangerous drug. Issue licenses for the cultivation, gathering or production at a stated place of opium, poppy, marijuana, or cocoa plant. Coca plant. Big difference. One letter. Name the ports or places in the territory where any dangerous drug may be exported or imported. Prescribe the manner in which any dangerous drug is to be packed and marked for export. Authorize the furnishing of dangerous drugs to the master of a ship for medicinal needs. Prescribe the records that are to be kept, etc. Section four. So, in 1991, the drafters of the law clearly contemplated an industry of cultivation, gathering, medicinal purposes, import, export of a dangerous drug, including its derivatives or any synthetic substance. So that's the existing law. So when we hear the advocacy coming out to say, I am ready to be a ganja planter. There is big money to be had. The rest of the world is looking at this. Trinidad and Tobago, please wake up and do something about it. Pass a law. There's a law. It was passed in 1991. It is therefore only subjected to the Minister of Health regulation. And obviously, there are implied aspects that go with that. The Minister of National Security, the Minister of Lands and Agriculture, the law enforcement agencies, all of these things have to articulate with what regulations look like. So our law actually is a very broad-based law. What the policy that stands behind this that will therefore result in a law is depends upon events like this. Because we have a society that is multicultural, but also has multifaceted views. There are some vehemently in support, some vehemently against any one issue. And that is certainly one of the cherished aspects of our democracy. So dangerous drugs hits the Children's Act. There are offenses, strict liability offenses, under the Children's Act. There are heavy fines that go there. Children should not be in sale or buying or delivering dangerous drugs. Stick a pin. What are we seeing in our social media? Are we seeing children in the course of events that they ought not to be involved in, in uniform, on television, by a replay? 
So these are deep issues for our society to look at. The point is that our laws criminalize these aspects. And therefore, in considering any debate on this, we've got to look at the broader laws in the round. The Customs Act applies. Section 33 of the Customs Act, which is an old law, provided quite properly for somebody not to ask for abatement of losses for the importation of ganja. What does that mean? Ganja was categorized in our laws very early in the day as no different from tobacco or cigarettes or cigarillos. And that's in our Customs Act right now. What took it out was the disadvantage in the Dangerous Drugs Act or the advantage, depending upon the way you look at it. Bottom line, you can't import or trade with these things. There are heavy consequences coming out of the Customs Act. And then all of these flow into a very important piece of law. It's called the Proceeds of Crime Act. The Proceeds of Crime Act is the act that catches all offenses and then allows the state to get the money back. The proceeds of drug trafficking, the proceeds of money laundering, those are the two big ones in the Proceeds of Crime Act, Chapter 1127, where benefit from drug trafficking, court can order amounts to be recovered. But Section 44 of the Proceeds of Crime Act is a real big one. That's the money laundering clause. And money laundering is where you have money that flows from any criminal activity. So just warning you that money laundering is also a significant event under the Proceeds of Crime Act. Possession of marijuana is quite simple. Strict liability, you need to have the thing. It doesn't matter what your mental intention in having the thing is. The act of having it is the actus reus. The mens rea is the mental intention to commit a crime. Normally you need the two things to have a crime. On this occasion, for dangerous drug, you're looking at it, just the act of possession means you're guilty. There are some nuances. Possession means control. So you could say, I didn't have control and I didn't have possession, but that's a battle for your lawyer and the magistrate or your lawyer and the judge. When we get down to the United Nations conventions, we've touched on them already. We have the international perspective spread across 1961, 71, 72, and 88. Bottom line, the rest of the world is treating with this phenomenon, and it's something that we have to be aware of. Decriminalization is not legalization as we started in the beginning to acknowledge. Because obviously, the decriminalization in the larger part of the world really refers to reduction of legal penalties, it applies to drug use and possession offenses, and it's really looked at managing your criminal justice system. And there's some very interesting material in the statistics that we've added on that will tell us who's in the system, for how much, and what they look like. Because that was a question that people asked of us. Because there's a thought that this thing is targeted towards one bracket of people, only one bracket of people suffer. So we're going to get to that from the statistics as to who we are. When we look to what is decriminalization, we're really looking around the world as we get to the Caribbean examples, we're really looking at possession control. How many grams of a particular thing can you have in your possession? And what about the production side of it? Where are you getting it from? It would be interesting to say that you could be in possession of a regulated amount, but you can't produce it. That Howard Jones song comes to mind. You can look at the menu, but you just can't eat. It's quite an interesting song to reflect upon how you manage this issue. When we get to the laws that will require amendment, obviously we've touched upon them. You can see it now. Proceeds of Crime, Children's Act, Customs Act, Dangerous Drugs Act, and there may be some other aspects that we have to look at that intersect in this equation. When we get to what is legalization, well, the US has dealt with that in a particular way. And their legalization is really focused upon the, the elements of it. Not so much the leaf as it is what comes from the leaf. And we're going to get to that a little bit later in the details of it in the free flow, marketed flow. But remember the example that legalization of many things have limits. And there, there are umpteen examples I can give you. You can sell tomatoes, but you can't sell rotten tomatoes. It's actually an offense under the Municipal Corporations Act. What the law permits, the law permits, as I've read in section four, an incredible venue that allows for that wide scale thing that people have been calling for. Cultivation, gathering, production, import, export, 
on the Minister of Health. It also permits in Section 5.2 that medicinal use aspect. So the law in Trinidad and Tobago always allowed for medicinal use of marijuana. That's the law. It's always been there since 1991 when we regulated the Dangerous Drugs Act. And prior to that, as the Customs Act says since 1938, we've had ganja coming in and out. Vets can use it. Dentists can use it. Doctors can use it. So there is medical prescription availability. That's why we have offenses available as to whether a doctor un unlawfully prescribes or is reckless, etc. Because we have to have controls in our society. You can drive, but you can't speed. You can drive, but you can't drive recklessly. Stats. These are the biggies that I want to come to. Number of persons on remand. Those of you who don't know what remand is, remand is when you're in jail awaiting a trial. So you are remanded into custody. Now, certain offenses such as murder, treason, they are non-bailable offenses. You're going to stay incarcerated in pre-trial detention whether you have your trial early or not. You're not going to be out. But other offenses are bailable. And dangerous drugs are bailable offenses. But in our courts, in our prisons, look at the numbers. 2013 to 2014, 14 to 15, 15, 16, 16, 17, 17, 18. 10,806 people in remand in the prisons in a circumstance where our remand yard has been described in judicial reflections as being unconstitutional or ungodly. And therefore, they, we, there's a significant impact to incarceration. Most people stay in remand because they can't access bail. You're granted bail, but you can't get it because you don't have land or cash to stand security. So that's a real thing for us to observe when we're looking at number of persons on remand for marijuana-related offenses, the number for marijuana in, the, in that period, 2013 to 2018, is 3,439, which is roughly 31%. Now, before you go off thinking, poor fellas, they're unjustly incarcerated, you didn't ask yourself what quantities they were there for. And trafficking under Section 5, 9, and sec subsection 5, 5 of the Dangerous Drugs Act is a serious thing. Trafficking is deemed to be trafficking if you have marijuana in your possession in a school. What's a school? The University of the West Indies. If anybody needs to leave, feel free. <laughs> Trafficking applies. It's a schoolyard. It's a game. It's a recreational ground. Anything within 500 feet of a school. So take note. Because the laws of Trinidad and Tobago have to be upheld. Secondly, trafficking involves any quantity that is over one kilogram. Anybody who needs to leave, free to leave as well. Bottom line, We've got to be careful about who's in there for what quantity. But suffice it to say, 3,400. We've just done a horizontal chart to show total versus marijuana possession. These will be available to you publicly. We've gone to another statistic of the persons remanded for marijuana in the period 2010 to 2018. We're looking now, number of persons remanded or on remand. And here's where we've gone for the different bits. Possession of marijuana. So of the 3,439, 2,407 of them for possession. The school limit trafficking law, 991. Cultivation of marijuana, only 41. Gathering of marijuana, that's an interesting concept. Gathering is described in the law, zero. The point is, the large number on the screen there is really possession of marijuana. And that is going to be compared against some further statistics. This is just the horizontal bar analysis, which shows you that particular comparative. But here's where we go into the rational discussion. Well, how much does it cost us as taxpayers? Because it's our money that run the prisons, that run the courts, that run Trinidad and Tobago. And when we're looking at this, if we look at the cost 
of incarceration. In remand, we average that it costs roughly about twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars per inmate per month in Trinidad and Tobago. By the time you add the prison's costs, getting to court and back, electricity, the lawyer, the magistrate, the policeman, the warrant officer, when you start to add that up and you put it on a per cost basis, you're getting a number which when you keep a man for more than 10 years, at 11 years it's costing you $2.64 million for one man. You then multiply that by the number of inmates over 11 years, because we took facts. We went to the prisons and said, how many people have been here for over 10 years? 246 inmates. Over 11 years, we're looking at more than half a billion dollars to keep that person incarcerated for over 11 years awaiting a trial, importantly. Similar numbers for under five years, five years or less, we've done the math. 1,565 inmates for under five years. Look at the figure. That's $9 billion. $9 billion on incarceration at that length of time. Now, these numbers are for remandees in general, not necessarily just for persons with marijuana possession. Bear that in mind. Point is, it's our money. How are we going to spend it? That's the horizontal axis um, analysis. Narcotics matters filed in the magistrate's court, 2010 to 2018. Ladies and gentlemen, 53,085 matters. With a caveat, we didn't get September to December. It doesn't include Princess Town Magistrate's Court. Our society clearly has an affinity for drugs. Because recognize that we're a transshipment point and there's an industry in narcotics. And the question is, where do we want to place resources as a nation in managing these statistics, which have a cost, obviously? Let's look. That's the horizontal axis, which will do the comparison for the increases. 80,815 marijuana-related matters, 2007 to 2018. 11 years, 80,815 matters. Possession, 69% of them, roughly, are possession. 14% for trafficking. Cultivation, 0.6%. Gathering, 0.02%. So we're spending our money, our resources, and our time in relation to possession matters. 68,000 of the 80 odd thousand are for possession. Let's get in. That's the horizontal axis, which is an easier way to read the graph and the statistics. We've looked at high court law term 2017-2018, average rate of disposition. Because it's one thing to know how many cases you have, how fast are they moving through your system. The litmus test for that you find in the prisons. That's why we went to the prisons to see who's been there for how long. That tells you how fast the wheels of justice are moving. Now, mind you, whilst I'm putting all of that onto the table, we could have a whole other seminar on how far we've come in what we've done to make that move forward. So I'll just flag that for a moment. We've been working on the system, and the results are coming. Let's get to average rate of disposition of matters. Suffice it to say, you're looking at 50%, 12.2%, 16%, etc as we begin to get into clearance rate, ratio numbers, middle column. If we're looking to across the magisterial districts in treating with 165,000 matters, when we look to the number of matters disposed of, 82,000 of them are disposed of. But ladies and gentlemen, that 165,000 matters includes traffic offenses, which is why we're moving them from a common sense basis out of the court. You will now get them in the mail. And if you don't pay, that's another story. Okay? Point is, the 65 to 45 odd thousand matters that are left are not necessarily going to be caught by the 50% disposition rate. It'll actually be lower, as you can see, the number of people in remand not moving. So, 
147 matters filed and listed in the criminal high court. After you've dealt with a preliminary inquiry in the magistrate's court, you've got to go to the high court, and in the high court is where you have your trial. And what we have here, the matters filed and listed in the court are only up to 147 for that period, the same period, 2007 to 2018, the same 11-year period. You take the 165,000 cases in the magistrate's court, those that have to go to the high court, that's how many you get. From thousands to hundreds. Let's look at the disposition moving on to magistrate's court. Possession, high court, possession, these are the matters. 4,321 are pending matters for marijuana at the magistracy and the criminal court. 3,337 in the magistrate's court and 981 in the high court. So we're seeing that the numbers are not being managed. It's just a further sweat of what the basic figures look like as we touched them earlier. The red items here, the age range of people in possession. Talking to a younger crowd today, 20 to 24, 15 to 19, 25 to 29, 30 to 34. If you look at it and you look at the numbers, we're in the hundreds. So we're seeing the indication from the data that our young people are being caught in this net. The not so young are there as well, 60 and over. You've seen the newspapers somebody's grandmother in for possession and trafficking. This category of narcotics and possession and trafficking really doesn't have an age respect, but you're seeing the headlights in the youthful range, and that's important to bear in mind. Let's look at marijuana possession, TTPS, because remember, the police may have matters that don't quite make it to court. You get to the police, you get to court, but one of the arguments are that the police are targeting people and bringing them up on charges unjustly. Because when you see the newspapers arrive or the cameras arrive at a crime scene, that's when you find out how good a person the person who was shot, killed, or arrested was. He was a good boy. He ain't hurt nobody in life. He was a good grandson. That's the way our society talks. So in analyzing that good or bad phenomenon, these statistics help. We're looking at marijuana possession in the hundreds, 20 to 34. 20 to 24, 634. 25 to 29, 634. 30 to 34, 584. And when we look at 2,800, 2,700, 2,400 in that age bracket, the police are very busy with thousands of people for possession. Let's go a little further. This one I sweated since the last, because somebody wanted to know, what's the culture look like? What do the people in possession look like? So I got from the prisons, ethnicity, numbers. Let's look at this. Number of remanded inmates for marijuana-related offenses, maximum security prison, 2014 to 2019. Ethnicity. Age range for Africans from 18 to 35, going across the years 2014 to 2019, 2,425 African inmates, sorry, that's the total. If we take African at that age group, 18 to 35, it's 1,720. 36 to 55, it drops to one third, 568. Over 56, it drops to 137. Asians, not the North American Asian type, right? Asians, meaning Orientals. Quite an interesting statistic. 18 to 35, one. One Asian. 36 to 55, zero. 56 and over, zero. So we know that Asian community in Trinidad and Tobago, which may include visitors as well, we see that we don't have a phenomenon among Asians. Let's go to East Indians. East Indians, total of 918. 18 to 35, we have 630. 36 to 55, 240. 
56 and over, 41. So we're seeing an ethnicity issue. Hispanic, 18 to 35, 37. 33, 36 to 55, 11. 56 and over, 1 for a total of 49. Mixed, 1,301. 18 to 35, 970. 36 to 55, 301. 56 and over, 30. So somebody had made the submission at the last event. Tell us what our people look like who are in problems with the law. So we went to the data, we took the advice, and we scrubbed the advice. So you can see that the data does show an African centricity and a young male African centricity, is what I can tell you. Because we're looking at remand inmates for marijuana related offenses and I can tell you that the women's side of incarceration is a percentage of the male side of incarceration. So it's fair to say that this is a significant issue for us as some of our advocates have said. Many people from the Rastafarian faith stepped forward and said, you're targeting me, and you're, ta and you're targeting young men from my community. And other people have step stepped forward and said the same. As I recognize those statistics, we've gone percentage of inmates convicted for marijuana, and then we've scrubbed the data against ethnicity. 18 to 35 Africans, 639. 18 to 35 East Indians, 378. 18 to 35 Asians, zero. Hispanics, 18 to 35, 8. Mixed race, 18 to 35, 294. So the first one was remanded. You didn't have a trial. The second one is you're convicted. And therefore, we can see that argument prospering from the statistics that there does seem to be an Afrocentricity young category that is most at risk in this particular discussion. This is what the rest of the world is looking like. I'm a little trigger happy, so I've lost the slide. What we did is we looked to the CARICOM region. Jamaica, now, as I said on the last occasion, my staff is rather innovative. You will see yellow, decriminalized. Red, not decriminalized, but used medicinally. G, which is in green, grams permitted. P, plants allowed. I, gold and green. And here we see in Jamaica, where we have decriminalization, two ounces, five plants, that's 56.7 grams, religious exceptions included. There's a very energetic young man who's actually at law school but working with us, sitting in the audience here, who went out and pulled out one ounce, is 28.35 grams, average quantity in a joint, 0.32 grams, 0.75 grams. I didn't ask him how he knew that. <laughs> I simply accepted that the TTPS told him from Kappa that that is what it looked like. So I thank you, and I thank the Faculty of Law for producing good young men. So St. Vincent and the Grenadines has not decriminalized, but medicinal use. Trinidad and Tobago, you know Section 4 is there. We have not decriminalized, but some medicinal use. That's why we're in red. And Antigua and Barbuda has a decriminalization. Big news off the press this morning, Barbados is on the trot. For medicinal use, Prime Minister Motley has announced. Um, perhaps she was listening to Prime Minister Rowley, who accompanies her on quite a bit of uh, work that they do together as they both stand in Uruguay right now, dealing with our geopolitical issues. But suffice it to say, the rest of the Caribbean is also coming ahead. Regional Commission effectively set up in 2014 in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. They said they'd rigorously inquire, they'll recommend, and they'll coordinate and collate findings. That's what they said. So the regional CARICOM position is happening. This is important because as a government, we've committed to the single economy, the CSME. If you have a CSME, you've got to be careful about tripping each other's laws. You may have seen a video that went fairly viral of a Canadian man who was speaking about having gone to jail for being charged for a shell of a bullet which was on a key ring. It's against the laws of Trinidad and Tobago. In Singapore, if you spit on the sidewalk, you will go to jail. You remember the case of Michael Fay? Michael Fay had presidential intervention because the US government was stepping in to tell the Singapore government don't cane the boy publicly for
for spitting on the sidewalk and having chewing gum. Saudi Arabia, they will kill you if they find you with drugs. You will be executed. Same thing in Singapore. So there are laws in countries. They may not make sense for some, but we've got to be careful about tripping each other's laws, and that's a simple point in this regional approach. Antigua, Barbuda, St. Vincent Grenadines, Jamaica, we've been touching on some of those things. Jamaica, two ounces or less of ganja, not an offense. Person found in possession, two ounces or less, who's under 18, or appears to the police to be under 18, dependent, referred to national council. You have to have drug counseling. Adherence to Rastafarian faith will be permitted to smoke ganja, sacramental purposes, in locations registered as places. Person who is suffering from cancer, terminal causes, each household allowed to legally grow, no more than five ganja plants. As I said on the last occasion, when it comes to West Indians, we're real good at finding excuses and the exceptions to the rule. So how large the plant is and how good hydroponics works in your yard might be different from someone else's yard. So I can imagine some massive trees versus some smaller trees. We'll see who has a green thumb or not from the Caribbean analysis. We get to Antigua context. 10 grams, 4 plants. You cannot use cannabis in a public space without being ticketed. We control smoking in our country. You can't smoke in public places indoors. You've got to step outdoors. For those of you who are too young to remember what it was like in my day, oh good lord, you just have to come home and scrub yourself from head to toe. Thanks Johnny Soon, as I recognize you in the crowd, for having a wonderful environment of Trinidad and Tobago enjoying themselves, but you can testify to what smoke used to look like indoors versus outdoors. We have um, St. Vincent and Grenadines decriminalized for medicinal and scientific research. They're positioning themselves for global leading in medicinal purposes, but I want to tell you, as we come down to the international perspective, global perspective, the industry is in chaos because, quote unquote, the ganja planter who has fought, the Rastafarians who have fought, the advocates who have fought, have now been edged out of the market because the pharmaceutical side requires strict control. No pesticides, no weed, no uh, allergens, no bacteria, no fungus. And therefore, you're not even looking at greenhousing you're looking at controlled laboratories. So just pointing that out, if you look to Holland, if you look to Denmark, if you look to different areas, you'll see that that's where the debate is. Bottom line, the whole world is talking. The slides will show you who's decriminalized, who's legalized, who's on the pharmaceutical end. Canada is fairly advanced in the equation, and they are the ones that handle it. On the slides, you'll find the number of grams. Five grams, 10 grams, Portugal, 25 grams. The grams go up in um, value as we come further south in the European uh, continent. Um, and then we see what we have in the Latin America and the Americas in general. The whole world is apparently in this discussion. Suffice it to say that the statistics show 183 million to 238 million have used cannabis at least once in their lifetime. And that's no small issue as you're talking about cross-border issues. These can be found across in the information slides as we come, but the age range shows us that this is a phenomenon that kicks in from as early as the age 12, and therefore we have to be real about it. Most prevalent age group, United States 12 plus, Australia 14 plus. I'm afraid to ask the question in other parts of the world and in Trinidad and Tobago, but we're going to ask it and have it dealt with. 135 countries are involved in some form of cannabis cultivation. We have also seen $9.3 billion price tag to the industry. And these all come from the United Nations website. This is the data that comes forward into what the size of the industry and the complexity of the industry and the age range factors look like. Cannabis, world's most seized substance. We're looking at five year period, 6,000 tons of marijuana. 1,300 tons of resin. Like drug uh, punishment, for any drug, marijuana is treated similarly. And you've got to be careful about the cross-border. 
So there you've seen we pull out Malaysia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Singapore. You're looking at life imprisonment for certain of these offenses, execution for some drug-related offenses. This is the important thing. THC, tetrahydrocannabinoid, and cannabidiol, CBD. I'll call them THC and CBD, again, not to offend. Bottom line, this is where the market and advocacy is. It's in the products, it's in these two products that we're looking at what the value to medicine is and what the value to industry is. And that's where the discussion comes in. The advocates for and against THC and CBD put these things forward. You're fighting the fact that the United States Schedule 1 says that there is no proven medicinal value for cannabis. On the other hand, umpteen states in the United States of America have decriminalized and gone into medicinal. So I think that their federal perspective is lagging behind their local perspective. We want to just point out, because I want to get to the issues, there are pros and cons, sleep, neuro neurological issues, cancer, pain management. These things are real in our society. Our doctors can tell you what the benefits are. We're going to have Dr. Pottinger on stage with us in just a moment. We're going to have Marcus Ramkisun on stage in just a moment to answer, in Marcus's case, what some of the international perspectives look like, because he's been drafting laws around the region in particular. And for Dr. Pottinger, he comes with a beautiful Jamaican accent to start with. And secondly, he has a very real medical position on this particular issue that I think is worth interrogation. Cannabis use will assist medicinal conditions. We've mapped them out. I've given you the summary version of it. But I want to get to an important bit, which is related to young people in particular, cannabis and the adolescent brain. The adolescent brain is a significant place and area of concern. We saw news reportage this week of a 16-year-old girl who committed suicide, supposedly on the back of her mother, taking her phone away from her. Whether there were deeper issues or not, it's what is reported. The point is it's an adolescent brain. And with cannabis having an impact upon individuals, including hallucinogen, it is a hallucinogen. Hallucina it's hallucinogenic. Hallucinations can flow from it. With it being a real consequence, and not wanting to make the rundown, I will say that we've got to be very careful about the adolescent brain. And this, ladies and gentlemen, comes into the conversation on vaping. I don't want to ask the young people here how many of them have an e-cigarette. But what I want to see is coming up in a slide here. How long marijuana stays in the body after smoking? If you're a chronic smoker, up to 77 days. If you don't smoke regularly, up to three days. Because it's been reported, and I'll underscore, I'm drafting the regulations right now for the introduction of a drugalyzer. Why? There are multiple accidents that occur and lives are lost on the back of cocaine, morphine, prescription drugs, and yes, cannabis. So we have got to have, same way we handle a breathalyzer or no smoking or speeding, the country deserves to be managed. Don't drink and, smile, uh, and drive, don't smoke and drive. It's as simple as that, if that is to be the law. So I want to send out the caution that the enforcement of societal standards is critical. Why? We saw a horrific accident yesterday, and my condolences go out to the families of people who lost their lives on our highways yesterday. Two beautiful grandmothers lost their lives sitting quite quietly on a PTSD bus. We would not want to know that the driver that careened, that hit the Blue Waters truck, that hit the PTSD bus, was not under the influence of drug or alcohol. And that's important in this conversation. 
So we've got to be careful about that. We know that there's psychosis or schizophrenia associated in some of the positions. We know cannabis use, I've been cautioned not to say polyuse by the Minister of Health, but the term does manage and manifest itself. And what I want to say, we went into a particular rehabilitation center. We found 837 males in the period of the 18 years, 2000 to 2018. And what we saw were approximately 100 persons being readmitted every three years. But it's the next slide that's interesting. If you take a patient and you look at their usage of tobacco, then to alcohol, then to marijuana, then to cocaine, there's a progression. Someone has been using tobacco for 34 years, then moved to alcohol for 31, then took up marijuana for 30 years, and cocaine for 20. So this is what... <laughs> That's what the poly means. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this, it may be... I want to put this into context. It's important... Okay. Let me ask by way of show of hands in here. How many of you have been to a public consultation held by any government of Trinidad and Tobago prior to 2015 that showed you the statistics of anything in Trinidad and Tobago? Put your hands up. One. What you went for? And you got the stats. I, I take the answer from the pause and the arm. Okay, so we'll, but you'll have a turn of the mic in just a little while. So what I'm trying to say is, when you look at data and you're beginning to corral data in your country, you have to look at the multiple sources. On the next occasion, we requested the information from St. Anne's and the Ministry of Health to see whether this thing is true or not. Is it twisted? Is it not? The data as presented at one rehabilitation center is not necessarily the data in all rehabilitation centers. So that's the point. The point is, it's there, let's look at it, let's see what it looks like. We have to ensure the driving aspects are controlled, we've just dealt with drug analyzers and other positions, and has it made a difference? That's a debate that's going on. Reduction in infectious diseases, tax-paying dollars saved, Legalization in some states has not led to rise of adolescent use. Medicinal and research purposes are welcome. But Jamaica came out quite recently and said, look, we've seen a significant uptick in adolescent admission as it relates to cannabis use. So is the Caribbean to be compared to the United States? I'm not quite sure. But obviously, the education campaign must be associated with the issue. Because this can't just be decriminalized and no education and no support services. So these are some of our discussions. Should we decriminalize? What are benefits? What are possible impacts? How are people affected? Do we want age limits? Do we want circumstances prescribed? Should your bus driver, should your teacher, should your doctor, should your lawyer, should your judge, should your politician be permitted the use of cannabis whilst on the job. These are all issues. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had multiple stakeholders who have contributed. We're anxious to get to the microphone. We are going to ask um, our invigilator, timekeeper, to keep you on the clock. She will manage the clock by telling you how much time we have. We look forward to your contributions. Try to make them in as summary a fashion as you have. I welcome Dr. Pottinger to come to stage shortly and Dr. Ramke soon to come. I'm sorry, Dr. Marcus Ramke soon to come. Dr. Pottinger will be back in a, in a, in a while. Yes, I, I correct him. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we're now on to question and answer. Come to the microphone, bring your advocacy forward. Um, you may want to find a line. I noticed that just hang on a second, and we will, get, we will get the coordinations done right. You can just stay on one lane and the other lane. Okay, we... Okay, good. So, what I'm gonna do, I recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that we have a number of people in uniform, children. And I know that you're gonna have a cutoff time, 
and that you would need to leave at some point. So I'd like your permission to allow the young people to speak first because their parents are going to manage. So with the greatest respect to all of our colleagues, you can stay right where you are. If you'd like to sit down in any of the empty spaces that are open in the lower chairs, and if there are any young people that want to come to the microphone, we welcome your voices. Students, university students, some of you have to catch classes at particular hours, so we're going to ask you to come first to the microphones. I'll invite the Minister of Agriculture and the Minister of Health onto our deck in case there are any questions that may be fielded to them. Okay, may we start off with the two young people at the back? You look as if you're not sure if you're young. I'm counting you as young. <laughs> so the young man in the trousers that I hope the army um, you don't have a look at? That's not helpful. That's not okay, helpful. good. Please, you're welcome. Please give us your name and where you come from. Hi, good day everybody. My name is Javed Baksh. I'm the manager of Grass Lab. So essentially what my company does is I supply CBD products to patients with different illnesses, both minor, major, um, everything from depression, cancer, epilepsy, Parkinson's, fibromyalgia, the list goes on and on. Now my company has a very limited resource in terms of getting medication. So I have a lot of patients that require Right, so I have a lot of patients that require THC apart from CBD. So I have cases like endometriosis, um, advanced stage four cancer, um, some severe cases of epilepsy, they require THC. Now, we don't have anything in place for that, but like you said, it's in the constitution for the minister to allow uh, the, the license to import and distribute. So I'm wondering from a medical aspect, what you have planned in terms for you know patients who have requirements for the additional cannabinoids thank you very much may i ask that we take contributions in threes and then we can do a round of um of, of answers so if we could take on the left hand side the young lady in the in the green jacket yes please coming to you Good afternoon, Mr. Ajay Al Ravi, Minister Hines. Uh, You're right. A quick question. No, the, the questions are going to start asked. No. Okay, so we've got no. Dr. Posinger oh. being mic'd, and his mic is on. That's that lovely Jamaican accent I was telling you about. So he'll be with us in just a second as we ask him to um, manage the mic. And sorry, could you please continue? No problem. So again, my name is Akila Holder. I represent. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Right. My name is Akila Holder. I represent the Trinidad and Tobago Council for Evangelical Churches. Just a few questions uh, based on some more research I've done. Now, what, based on what you've said, it seems to me that you're pursuing partial decriminalization. Is that correct? Sorry, would you repeat that? There are two types of decriminalization, marijuana decriminalization. Yes. There is full decriminalization and partial decriminalization. What type are you, is, your gov is the government proposing? Can I take all of your questions and I'll answer in the round? No problem. Uh, have you considered the possibility that decriminaliz decriminalization of marijuana will have a net widening effect? In other words, you're going to arrest more people. And while you're trying to level the playing field with regards to arresting, making sure that not just Af people of African descent are arrested for marijuana possession or use, but that also those of the higher classes, uh, wealthier people, are arrested for it. There's a possibility that when you impose fines on individuals for uh, possessing marijuana, the, those of the poorer classes will not be able to pay the fines. What happens then? Do they go to jail? In which case, decriminalization may actually be counterproductive because if they're not able to pay the fine, then they're going to go to jail. Whereas those in the, uh, the upper classes will be able to pay the fee and, and they're just going to get off. And it, it will have the same effect. The, fine, very nominal. the next issue I have is... Uh, well, you, full decriminalization may actually be something to consider given that it's no possibility of arrest, no incarceration, and no public stigma. Partial decriminalization, decriminalization on the other hand, will may still lead to people being incarcerated. 
and they're going to have a criminal record. So maybe full decriminalization may be something to consider if you go that way. Uh, that way people can be rehabilitated. So it remains prohibit prohibited, but this time instead of jail time or being arrested, they can be sent to uh, rehabilitation centers. In that case, if you decriminalize, you may want to look at investing in, uh, what is it? Harm reduction programs and drug treatment programs. So if you're decriminalizing, it's actually, you, you want to consider investing in those areas. Thank you very much. Can we take one more question and then we go for a round of answers? Any, please. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm Warren Anderson of the UV St. Augustine Guild of Students, the evening and part-time representative. Um, I just have a few questions on the capturing of the data. Did we attempt to capture the income brackets of, the, of those incarcerated? Right? Um, is there going to be funding for research projects into um, the psychological and behavioral profiles of the young persons using marijuana? And um, are we looking at what is leading young people towards marijuana and drugs on a whole? Are we looking at the stressors at home or in school? And how does this relate to um, our current laws on marijuana on campus? Right? So that's it for me. So we've got three questions coming. The first one is CBT and THC, the medical aspect. Um, if I could just officially again introduce Dr. Pottinger, Marcus Ramkisun, of course, Minister Hines and I sitting from the AG's office. I'm going to give what the government's perspective is, but I'm going to ask any one of our contributors here, in Dr. Pottinger's case on the medicinal side, to speak to things that flow from that and in Mr. Ramkisun's side, what the other jurisdictions that he has assisted in drafting look like. And of course, Minister Hines and I will coordinate. So the first question on medicinal, um, what is the planning and how we're going to manage the product and supply arrangements. What we propose is that after the consultation is completed and we know what the medical side arrangement ought to look like, in particular how it is controlled the regulations which are in the works right now, those regulations are going to be put forward which will allow for an easier access to controlled substances for those purposes. Mr. Ramkisun has in fact done a significant amount of drafting of those regulations, so I'll ask him to chime in. Um, and let's perhaps deal with question one first. So I open it to the members sitting here now. On the CBD, THC, medicinal side, and also regulatory side from a supply and demand. May you need to speak a little louder. Yeah, we'll, we'll borrow the hand mic. Yeah, here we go. Thank you so much. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. All right. So in terms of a framework, uh, when framework is ready, and I mean this is when after these public consultations, as you said, when we get everybody's opinions together and we decide what we're taking, what we're not taking, then framework is put into place. Um, what we've done in Antigua so far and what you're seeing in Jamaica and even St. Vincent is a medical regulation. The main reason that they've chosen to go medical as opposed to recreational is because international guidelines to which we are a member country of basically state that we can only go medical and recreational. Now, a number of persons uh, uh, have the idea that uh, THC and, and CBD or cannabis in the whole may be legalized, especially within the US and the federal, on a federal level, coming very soon. What we've actually seen is just this last week, the WHO has issued a, a, an order to the, or at least a recommendation to the international community, to the, the INCB, the International Narcotics Control Board, uh, and the Office of uh, the, National, the International Office of Drugs and Crime, and um, they've recommended that CBD 
which is non-psychoactive, be removed completely from the schedules. It's not in effect yet, it's just a recommendation so far. And that THC remain on Schedule 1. So what you will see in the next coming years is more of an enforcement of medical regulations within countries. So it's left to be seen what decision will be taken internationally, but that is the direction it's heading. Uh, as for your particular question with what you're doing now with CBD and stuff, I do have to advise you that under the current law, as much as the uh, OCIU has said that CBD is legal in Trinidad and Tobago uh, once there's no THC in it, as far as we're to understand from the current law, it is not legal. Uh, furthermore, even if you were to take that argument to decide, any product that you have to sell or produce to, to be sold must go through the Drug Inspectorate of Trinidad and Tobago to be tested and approved. You have to supply a number of documents, including certificate of analysis, so that they would know that the product that you're bringing and supplying to persons is not harmful to that person. This is one of the effects of protecting public health. So I'm sorry to say, but what you're doing in effect now is actually not legal. Also, unless you're a medical practitioner, you're not supposed to have patients or treat patients. You can advise persons, but treating of patients is not really allowed unless you're a medical practitioner. That's to answer your question. Dr. Pottinger. Um, sorry, yeah, just before ask. you do that, I think we should respectfully pay a tribute and recognition to the presence of Professor Copeland, the principal of the UE. Let us welcome and welcome Dr. Pottinger. Dr. Pottinger. Well, I really, I really don't know what the question was because I wasn't here. So, so. It, it, it was in relation to CBD and THC, the contributors suggested well, the con contributor informed, I wanted to take it as a hypothetical as opposed to anything else. He informed, he informed that um, patients required the use of um, CBD and THC and that it was hard to come by. And we've had a very good reflection on what the law currently says and what the process looks like. So just to answer that question, the regulatory side that the Minister of Health is going to introduce to this will treat with that. And that's something that, in fact, Mr. Rankisun is going to assist us in, so far as he's a leading expert in this area. So I'm pleased to announce that the Attorney General's office is working alongside Mr. Rankisun. But Dr. Pottinger, your, it's a convenient opportunity for you to give a little snippet into some of the medicinal sides, CBD, THC sort of perspective. All right. Um, the cannabis plants have about over 100 uh, analyzed what is called cannabinoids, and over 200 what is called terpenoids, or essential oils. Now, most people, when they say medicinal marijuana, they, they basically narrow it down to THC, not THC, CBD, right? And everybody know now that this is the one that is being used for, you know, children and so with epilepsy and other things, because it don't cause the psychotropic effect. But if you want to widen things for medicinal use, the THC is very, very important. And, um, <laughs> yeah. So, the, what is called the entourage effect is really the thing. So, this is a situation where the plant as a medicine is actually better than the constituency taking all the different, different things. All right? So, uh, with respect to like cancer treatment. It's over 40 years now we know that THC is very, very effective to kill cancer, especially brain cancer, right? Studies have been done in the USA itself, University of Virginia from 1974, when they were looking in petri dish cancer cells and the THC was killing them. So they went on to animal studies, mice and rats, and they actually introduced the brain, the brain cancer into the mice and rat. Once the cancer took hold, they then inject the brain with THC and the THC was killing all of the cancer without damaging the brain cells, right? Now, because of how things set up in the States, they don't want to have any studies that were going to show beneficial effect at that time. Everything that being funded must show adverse effect. So they shut it down and try to bury all of the information. If it wasn't for some of the doctors and scientists involved, that keep some of the information and then let it go later. Wouldn't know anything about this. 20 years after that, the people in Spain and Portugal started to look at the same thing, to the point where they even requested the information from Virginia and couldn't get it. So they basically have to reinvent the wheel again. And the studies show the same thing again. 
not just for breast cancer, and not for brain, but breast and other cancers too. Now, if this, if this is born out with proper studies, we're probably getting there now, what we call double-blind control randomized trial or something close to that, so it won't be anecdotal information. This will be a quantum leap forward because even though chemotherapy, and I'm a proponent of chemotherapy, I give chemotherapy all the time, right? But it has a lot of downside because it can't discriminate between the cancer cells and the normal cells. Now, if, if THC, along with the rest, but particularly THC, could kill cancer cells without the collateral damage, quantum leap forward. So I can't wait for the, the thing to let go, that proper studies can be done. You know, so that, um, Thank you. I just want to make a little point. Yeah, one more Just point. one interruption. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been informed insofar as we're televised that the lines are complicating the view of the cameras. So what we have are a few people seated in the audience who will take note of whose hand went first. We see the people in the line right now, but we're going to ask you to have a seat just in the front right here. Okay? Have a seat and, and we'll bring the microphone to you as well, okay? Sorry, doctor. All right. I just want to make people know so we know that there are some downsides to THC, right? Apart from, the, but the big set of things that people believe, believe that it was psychotropic effect and you're going to get so much schizophrenia and everybody's not going to have ambition and all them kind of things. By and large, it's not true. A small amount of any population is genetically predisposed to psychosis. And if those people start to use the thing at a young age with heavy use, so we're talking about adult, less sense for with, <laughs> with, with, with heavy use for a prolonged period of time. Nobody disputing that this can cause brain damage because we know the brain is fully mature till about 25, particularly what is called the white matter. I don't want to get into a little biology question, but you have gray matter and white matter. The gray matter basically is the, is the, is the cell part, the brain or the nucleus. And then the tail of the, of the, of the, of the neurons is called the axon. And that is, co is covered by something called myelin sheet, where that show white. That don't really fully mature until you're about 25. And heavy use of cannabis early, we know, can actually diminish. Wait, let's say, let's just put it, say the, 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 the IQ that you should finish with, about 120, you might end up with 110. If you're supposed to finish up with 110, you end up with, with 100. So we know it can damage your brain. So I'm not advocating no young people to be using ganja in a, any dose at all, right? Are, are going too long? No, not at all. <laughs> I, I think that you might be stopping half of the questions in the crowd. But, <laughs> but doctor, let me, let me put questions two and three, because that was one, yeah. to the rest of the panel. We promise you we're going to take this in threes. So we had from Ms. Holder an interesting position representing the evangelical churches. She was speaking about full decriminalization and partial decriminalization. And she also mentioned some of the obvious positions about whether you're actually going to make the problem worse by having more people use. When the application of fines is put upon that, the allegation that, well, the poor will be even more entrenched into difficulty, and the rich would faster pay fines, if I could translate what she said in my own words. And she asked about the whole position of partial awareness, alternative for incarceration, and harm in the projects, etc. So from the government side, and I know Minister Hines would be part of this, I can tell you that we're not looking, this concept of full decriminalization, if that's intended to mean legalization, we don't think we're ready for that. Because we are in the process of having to manage who we are, what we are, what's happening, and we prefer to take it in a phased approach into this discussion. I can tell you that with respect to the alternatives to incarceration and the need for counseling, etc., that's a part of what we put in already. In our family and children division court in particular, there is referral to drug counseling, and there are alternatives to incarceration, including the use of peer resolution. So the, the truth is, fines can be applied more frequent breakers of the law, but it's no different from driving a car. When we apply a ticket for a car, you don't stop and ask the guy, what's your socioeconomic background? Can you afford the ticket or not? Either you're speeding or you're not speeding. So those things are hard to disaggregate. 
I, I want to ask the rest of the panel to chime in if they have any views on it, and I'll allow you to come back in just a second. Um, so, members are there, Dr. Pottinger, is there anything from the medical side that you thought b bit into that? Marcus, is this something that you've come across in the other regulations elsewhere? Minister Hines, from the other work that you're doing? I just, I just think as well that conceptually, if you decriminalize, the question of criminal sanctions will not apply. If you decriminalize, that is to say you permit possession and use of a certain amount, persons within that will not be subject to any criminal sanction, and I don't foresee you'll have more people arrested as you posited. Well, actually, Go ahead. Yeah, in most countries where they have the fine, the fines are usually nominal. And um, yeah. it's only if you don't pay the fine, like in Australia, if you don't pay the fine, and don't, then you might get someone to court. And, and then it, it may have some, you know, um, you may go to, you know, go to jail, probably. But the fines are usually nominal, it's not a prohibitive thing. In all the places, I know. No, uh, I don't, people like to believe that if the thing gets decriminalized, a whole host of people go and jump on the bandwagon and start to use the thing. Again, it's a certain proportion, about 4% of any population, given to using drugs. Right? So you find, like for instance in Holland, where, where the thing has in my freed up a good while now, it never have a big mushroom of people jump on the bad bandwagon. In fact, I was just looking at some numbers this morning, and it's just about 30% of the population, well, the, the, the um, school population in England, have ever used cannabis. Not in England, in Holland. While in England it's like 38%, where you have prohibition. Right? So you find other places too, I mean Australia, they free up the thing in a big, big way from all the way back in 94, and it did the mushroom. When you look at Portugal, it's like probably the best example. They free up all drugs across the board, everything, from 2001. And it, a, a large proportion of people didn't jump on board and start to use it. So all this prediction that if the thing gets decriminalized or even legalized, a mass of people going to start to use it. It's not true. It's a certain proportion given to it. And then the gateway theory, uh, I don't know why we're trying to reinvent the wheel with the numbers you just showed me there a while ago from St. Anne's or wherever. I mean, but this has been proven over and over. This gateway theory thing does not, is not true. So the places have been using this all the time. I mean. So, Dr. Pottinger, the, the, the government's objective is not to plead a case. Yeah. It may suggest that we, our objective is to carry information to people that come from multiple stakeholders. So I, I, whilst I have a certain view, I, the individual, have an absolute view of what I would like or don't like. I don't have the privilege of expressing that view just yet. Yeah. So just bear in mind that when we bring information, it is for the purposes of causing thought and not necessarily a convinced argument. And I love the information you give. You give plenty of information. But sometimes, sometimes, I live in here a long time, I regard myself, I kind of know the country. I'm in Trinidad 40 years old. You could develop a little accent, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and they're and even with other medicinal properties, with other drugs. In Trinidad, people always want to reinvent the wheel. So the Trinidadian is a different species of homo sapiens. So you cannot, you cannot, um, you cannot extrapolate things from elsewhere. So the, this gateway theory, many, many people have looked at it in big volumes, bigger volumes than what we have here, and it's showing it don't happen. I'm going to moderate you. Yeah. Mark us. Right. right. So <laughs> back to the, the, the policy side and to answer your question. Um, yes, it is correct that that most of the countries and states that have decriminalized or legalized, if you will, have seen a decrease in the use of the drug, right, first of all. Um, a lot of people seem to think that if you decriminalize or legalize any, which of, any, any one of the above, that more people would have access to it. And I want to confirm for you that this is not true at all. In a regulated system, right, we don't mean, when we say legalize and decriminalize, right, and this is one of the points I wanted to make in terms of the AG has discussed what is the, the difference between legalize and decriminalize. What about legal and regulated? Driving is, is, is no need to clap for that one, thanks, but, but driving, is, driving is regulated, right? You have to be a certain age, you have to have a, a license to also, if you, uh, as the AG said, if you drive recklessly, you'll be, you'll be uh, uh, put under, it's an offense, you'll be, you'll be convicted. So legal means something that there's no criminal penalty attached to. 
and very few things in society are absolutely legal and not regulated. The, 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 sure, the, types of clothes, the type of clothes that you buy in a store, right? That is legal, that is not overly regulated. Where and how you wear that clothes, that is regulated. Right? You can't come out in the street and walk about naked, that's an offense. Right? That is public indecency or some or, or yes. the name of it around here. Right? So, so, so again, a lot of things in society are regulated and we need to understand the difference. Right? So as, as long as cannabis is a consumable product, something that you're putting into your body in any way, form or fashion, there's going to be a large amount of regulations guiding it, like with any food or beverage product today. Be before you do your intervention, and I know others are, are anxious to get in, I will just say to Warren Anderson from the University of the West Indies, asking about income brackets and those who are incarcerated, funding research projects for users for analysis by the university base, etc., and what leads to these uh, tendencies, what causes use, stress factors, etc. We certainly believe that these are things that ought to be analyzed. I've often called for the University of the West Indies to get into the dance. When we were talking about child marriage, I asked for people to step forward and say, come and look at the data. Ask for data and we will get it to you. I regret to say, I haven't received a single request for data. So I can certainly make myself available to access the data. I think that doctoral projects, I think that MSc projects are deserving of further analysis into what Trinidad looks like, but I dare say, and here's a challenge out to the principal, I think that we ought to encourage analysis when we look at theses and we look at other aspects of Trinidad and Tobago, because there's a massive amount of information available that is not being exploited, extrapolated, or analyzed. So that's something that we can do. The young lady wanted to say something quickly, and then we want to take six more contributions, and then go into the round. Hold your hand for a second. Yes, please. Now a correction. I think you misunderstood my question. My question. Now when I sure. talked about full decriminalization, I based it on a study by Alexandra Natapop, who's a misdemeanor expert at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. And she determined that full decriminalization is when you basically remove penalties. No possibility of arrest, no incarceration, no public stigma. You raised the issue of Portugal, and that's exactly what they did. In 2001, they decriminalized all illicit drugs. It remained prohibited. It was not legalized. It Understood. I think hold we've on. answered it. So hold on. what, 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 in, in how? No, no, you didn't answer Hold on a second. You did not answer it. Hold on. Hold on a second. Okay. They, so I, I apologize that I have, as I did say, I put it into my own words, and I drew the caveat as the way I understood it. So you've, we've noted you've corrected the record, one. Two, I think that Marcus, in answering the issue about regulation, uh, okay, hold on, we've got a whole auditorium. So what I'd like to do is to field six more questions with the greatest of respect. I'm very happy to actually have deeper conversations with you. If you put I it in point I form, what is it? It was not about regulation, it's about net widening. What happened in the United States is basically when they decriminalized marijuana, they caught more minorities than they would be right. So okay. it's not about regulation, it's about the phenomenon of net widening. So you're actually going to catch more people. Okay, thank you. We got it. Appreciate it. Let's be respectful for people's time and event. Um, you were next, please. No, the gentleman next to you and then you. And then... Okay, I apologize. I got it wrong. <laughs> Hold on. So we go with you. Okay. Hold on. Let's calm down. Get it right. So, here's where we're going to go. As far as I saw it, looking both left and right, not in one column, I had certainly three people on that end, two, three here, and then I'll come to you on that end. So if we could, I'm sorry if I got it slightly wrong, I'm just going to mix it up a bit. If I could go one, two, three on that bench. One, two, three on this bench here. Let's take the six in round. We'll get to everybody. So we're going to put, forgive me if I interrupt, it's just to try and catch what you're saying in a more precise fashion. So bear with me, okay, guys? Sir, would you please go? Good afternoon, Honorable, Honorable Ministers. Everyone Could you take the mic right up to your face? Uh, I just, everyone here will come forward to talk about the medicinal use and the... What's your name, sir? Israel Samuel, public servant. 
of this. For fear of um, don't worry, don't worry, we're good. I'm Go ahead. Good. No. We'll do the blur on the screen and the voice modulation. Hold, hold the mic for me. I want to use this pad. Right. Um, what no one is talking about is the ecological effects no. that cannabis has on the society. Marijuana, hemp, is the number one carbon absorbing plant in the world. So we will be doing our part in carbon emissions. Regular that. Besides that, the hemp plant creates industries from cotton just clothing, just ethanol. Yeah. Oh, God, everybody know the thing. We know the yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. So at, at, what at, I'm, at I'm Napa against. we got at Napa we got a long treatise on the advantages of the ecological and um, other points. A very important point. In fact, what I'll do is I'll on the next occasion I'll add up some of that info so you know that we are paying attention. All right. Well, since we have all this information, I just want to ask you three questions. Are you aware that your poll, your Ministry of Legal Affairs poll, currently stands at 15% 15 no, 85% yes, and that is with 700,000 votes? Yes. All right. Wow. The Minister of Health. I didn't know that. Mm, that I'm going. The Minister of Health, I would like to find out how much per permits were applied for and how much were issued since 1991. Zero. Zero. Because the regulations have not been developed. Okay, okay. That's why we're having this conversation now and why I pointed you to section four. All right, all right. We want to get that in gear. Because let me put it this way, there's been a black market. The country knows that doctors are using it for genuine purposes and turning a blind eye. So let's clean it up. All right. And the third thing is, what are we, if it is decriminalized or legalized, what are we doing with those incarcerated people that got back to flood the streets? Are we going to use the same industry to provide jobs for them and be proactive instead of retroactive. Mm. Brilliant question. Questions. Thank you, sir. Can we take one from this end and then we'll come on to these, these things? So just alternating. That's an interesting shoot. My name is microphone closer. We okay. actually want to get into. Yeah. Se second question. 
Second question. Yeah, so we want, I really want to know what you would do for restaurants um, as it pertains to a farm to fork program. You. If I could have five cannabis plants at my restaurant and use it in food, how they would regulate that, right? Um, and that's about it. Thanks for your time. Deal. Thank you. That's yeah. a wonderful contribution. We'll come to you there. Can we go to number two on this end over here? Before, which is number three? Before we do, please permit me. Hello. Ras, before we go, please permit me. When we were at Napa on the last occasion, I raised, based on what I heard from one of the speakers, the question for discussion as to whether marijuana is a drug or not. I am fully aware of the very popular sentiment, which you applauded a while ago, that it is not a drug. But there is a very forceful argument that it is. If we think that a drug is chemically manufactured as opposed to it being natural in a plant, that is not the only consideration. And I think if Trinidad and Tobago, if we have to proceed honestly in this, popular or not, we have to discuss and settle the question, basic as it is, as to whether marijuana is a drug or not. I am not ignorant of the popular sentiment and where the applause will come from, but we have to be real truthful going forward in this. Rastafari. Yes, just before, <coughs> let me just touch something upon that too. Is this, this, so um, I, I would like to hear Dr. Pottinger, <laughs> an expert, because I am not mm -hmm. address this question yeah. today mm -hmm. going forward. You all realize Any, it's hard to moderate this event, right? Yeah. So, say a prayer, right, Doc? <laughs> Any chemical that will affect a receptor in a certain way, whether it be agonist and the receptor or antagonist and the receptor, and you want to use it for a certain effect, is a drug, right? So, and, so this plant has many drugs in it. So THC is a drug, and CBD is a drug, and CBC is a drug, and Rastafari. CBN is a drug, and CBG is a drug. <laughs> right, Copy. because... Uh, you see, be, and, and oh, because it is natural, aspirin come from a plant, metformin come from a plant, Cookie. natural plant, Opium. French lilac, all of these kind of things. So if you, <laughs> it have to be a drug because it has so much risk. TBD is not just uh, affective. I'm and moderating here again, Doc. We're yes, coming back not, to you there. Let's get some more CB1 contributions to going around. But Take with it, affect, it affects, you know, I just trip. <laughs> All right, let's go to, go to, go to. Yeah, yeah, go to. Yeah, all right. Yes, my brother. Hi, greetings to the head table. Acknowledgement to all ministers, the head of UE staff members, and Rastafari brothers, sisters, everyone in the audience. Right? Um, at the last consultation, I made an appeal for the government of Trinidad and Tobago to stop arresting citizens for this marijuana plant or drug or whatever. I want to make the appeal again. Gotcha. Right? You deal with it now. Um, in answer. Limit the plants in terms of the law. How much seeds do I have to plant to get one, seed, one good female plant? <laughs> honestly. Honestly speaking. Yeah, yeah. Because there's male and female. So you can't tell me five plants, I get five male and I have to live with that. All right, the next thing, you mentioned research. As a student, I am willing to do research on marijuana. As soon as either UTT or UE starts a program, I am first to enroll. Um, what else is here? Well, I must mention what happened to my Rasa brother down at the rally in South. Because if we are advocating for something, we will do other things. Why is it that the police come in a marijuana rally to lock up a citizen of the country? That is entrapment. I want to get, I want to get, I want to get, we only have three so far. I want to get three more brothers and sisters on the microphone. Oh All right, no problem. I'll go off now. God bless Next you. Next time I'll come and talk again. No, bless no, you. we'll answer you in a bit. Can we go on this side of the, of the stage? Yes, my turn. 
Yes, my name is Lord Mason, right? And I have an experience of body weed, right? It's on, it's on. Yeah, you just need to yes. speak. Yes, I said the word in 83, right? And I have an experience of body weed. Can you also smoke it? And that he, he regretted he ever smoked the weed. But I'll tell you why I said the word and I had the experience. I'm sorry, we, we're having a small problem with the microphone, but while we address that, just hold on a second. Um, I, I do remember because you contributed at Napa and told us the story, so we have it noted down carefully. Yes. Is there something else that you wanted to contribute on? No, um, yes, I, I am. You are with a, with a, with a Trinidadian yeah. man, and he's a love plenty guy, and he's lady. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let me do a favor. Let's you and I gonna have a chat a little bit on the side. Forgive me for a moment, okay? <laughs> yes. Asha. Asha, could could I ask the brother? Um could so just let me hear the last few points that you're saying there and then we come across here. Yes. He was the life from the Guyanis lady. So he's on to a Guyanese lady with his car in the airport. Carry them. Okay, I'm going to interrupt them. because I recall this from Napa and I have my notes from Napa here with me, okay? Yes. So, could I invite, the, while you think about something that you want to come with, let me ask my brother over here to just yeah. come on that one. We'll come back to you in a moment. Right. Okay, please. <laughs> yes, sir. Winston Edmond, Bongo Zap from the house of the Nabingi, a member of the Old Man Chance. And I'm a member of the New City Sports and Cultural in Faisabad. A very firm, all protocols observed, greetings to the gathering. I thought it was James Earl Jones. <laughs> I spoke recently with Mr. Potenja, Dr. Potenja, and the Raleigh in San Fernando, and he told me about the brain and the 25 years to develop, and I went back, I agree with him, and I went back to the drawing board. I spoke also with Mr. Marcus Wangti soon at the last consultant and also in the Valley and Faisabad. And get, I was a man for legalization, but he got me to understand, which I fully do, about the importance of decriminalization. I went to school in Prima College from 66 to 71. That is the time when marijuana was rising and black consciousness was rising. The days of the Tom Jones and the Temptations and the James Brown. And the place was nice. <laughs> 66 assembly. And that's when marijuana started to rise again in Trinidad and in the face of the earth. Very interesting. And also, I will, to be, that is what happened here today, Sadi Foundation. And also from Faisabad in the 1930s, a man named Timothy Rudal, a right, he bought Marcus Garvey in Trinidad. You will find that in the philosophies and opinions of Marcus Garvey. He brought Marcus Garvey to Trinidad, he came today, and he had to leave on the next plane. Because they said he was subversive. The state, Faisabad never, some people in power never forgive the state for that. Mr. Edmund, I want you to get to your question. Yes, right there. Well, that is the start of my question. That dealing directly with my to the fact that you have to be careful with connotations, misinformation, and even what is called subversive. That was the lesson leading into marijuana because there's a lot of misconceptions concerning marijuana. In 1971, in 1971, the pan movement is a fight a lot. And the minute marijuana reached in the pan yard, Everything runs smooth. The peace and love, no fight on the streets the minute marijuana entered the panyard. That is to be underlined. Thank you, thank you, sir. I want you to get to the crux of what you want to see. Lovely. <laughs> the same Friday the 17th, Friday the 17th of July 2000, I led a delegation to the then Attorney General Ramisar and Faraj. It fell flat due to the airport scandal. 
In the days the Hades and Marijuana and Children and Tobago, I have to relay this to this country, short as I could. I hear about the madness, I hear about the overdose. The place is nice in Trinidad. Crime, they hardly had crime. This marijuana thing is not a thing to smoke, 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 smoke. That thing that's coming in this country. It had nice dance. You've had us to work hard in this country. Gold was like Eldorado in this country in those days. There was no robbery. There was no snatching of gold. They bring all employment in knees. All right, brother. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah. We got I have two more we, points, two important points to the yeah, government. Make them, make and two real quick, two important points. There's a bill, shelf in Parliament, either 82, 83, or 81, for the legalization of marijuana. There's a bill, take note, shelf in Parliament, for the legalization of marijuana. The year is either 82, 83, or 81. I tried to get it. That's I okay, I'll get it. Yeah, I wanted to get it. And last but not least, I want the government to remember the 1990 coup. The best behavior this country gave for a coup, and it is from the Mariana base. Long time the police hardly had work in this country. The Mariana smokers is to have the place in our manners. We do not need police, and honestly, and the Lavantails, and the Steelers, and the Beatum was nice. Somebody spoiled it, like in Jamaica. It didn't have gone so much in Jamaica. One well, last point. You see how Jamaica, you see how Jamaica, all them gone? The election between Edward Siaga and Michael Manley. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. My have been good to this country and I'm moving on. I have more to say if needed. I have plenty to say on crime and my to this country. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask for your permission. Because I was at the consultation on the last occasion, I recognize a few strong contributors who have returned to contribute a little bit more. And I'm going to ask for your permission to allow me just to select out from some of the hands that I'm seeing in the crowd, just to get a little bit more diversity. Okay? So, hands down just for a moment. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, Raymond Ramcharita, I'm a journalist. Um, I think there's an element of this debate that Dr. Pottinger is alluding to that uh, you're missing and which is hamstringing the debate and you are completely ignoring the sociological and epistemological elements. The way your data is used and the way it comes from. Um, this, a lot of the moods and even the vocabulary that accompany the marijuana debate come from reefer madness. Mm -hmm. This is a propaganda program started by the US government in the 1950s. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is you cannot have a sensible argument if your terminology and the way you use the knowledge, the way you cherry pick your statistics, are flawed from inception. That's the first point I want to make. The second point is a lot of the claims made of marijuana, what I notice you're not doing is contrasting it with alcohol. Um, and there's, there are two key facts which are not informing the debate. One is that a lot of drug use and addiction are about, the research I have, which I will show you, is about 70 to 80% due to childhood trauma. People do not use drugs because they are evil. That is, those simple facts are missing from your debate and they are missing how you interpret and frame the event. And unfortunately, consultations like this are usually hogged by religious fanatics who find all kinds of unrelated data to cover what is puritanical prejudice. Now, I know your time is short, so I'm going to show you this book, which I hope you will get. It's called Chasing the Scream by a British journalist, Johan Johari. Johan Hari, forgive me. It was published in 2015. It was written by a journalist, but it has a hundred pages of footnotes and bibliography. It's very well documented. It's got all the, not well, certainly not all, but it's got an enormous amount of data. And it's got a lot of alternative experiments and research on drugs, which do not make it into official narratives, which as I think Dr. Pottinger said, 
The narratives are determined before the research begins. You have to find things that support the narrative. And the final thing I want to say, what would you say about a drug that had a side effect of killing you, causing you to bleed rectally, and to go crazy and become a possible danger to others? That's chanting, which is used to stop smoking. Okay? All the drugs, from everything from high blood pressure to heart to erectile dysfunction, have a list of side effects which